Thank you, Julia. Some people kind of amaze me, like she got word yesterday evening to come and lead worship, and she did it, and thank God. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, we've uh, we got a lot of people sick, and unfortunately for them, they will become a metaphor for today's sermon, uh, because... Uh, I'm going to continue what we were talking about last week. Here's the premise. Um, you might have noticed this, uh, but people are very complicated. Uh, we are very complicated physically. Like uh, things um, can happen, like has happened to many in our fellowship uh, just in the last few days. You're just kind of going on in life. And some microscopic little something, uh, you get it in you, and it radically alters your plans, your future, what you thought you were going to do, and you have to deal with that uh, in a different way. Usually it makes you feel miserable, it, um, it disables you in some way for a period of time, and uh, you hope for recovery. You know, maybe if it's serious enough, long enough, you go to a doctor and, and uh, things sort of improve along the way uh, with their help. Sometimes a doctor will shrug and go, eh, you know, go home and eat some chicken soup. Uh, you know, it, it's complicated. And, and we're fairly competent in the physical realm. I mean, we have blood tests and MRIs and all kinds of things that can help detect injuries, diseases, illnesses that are in us physically. Most of whatever the doctors do to help us recover from those things is to try to assist the already healing processes that are in our body. Like they'll give us antibiotics for certain things because those medications trigger our own immune system to fight off whatever there is that needs to be uh, dealt with. Uh, same with uh, certain injuries, like if you, you cut yourself in a certain way and you need um, somehow to stop the bleeding and you don't have that within your blood system, the, the platelets and all that are needed, they'll give you platelets to help clot that up. Or if you have too much... Uh, uh, clotting factor in your blood, they'll give you something to thin your blood. There's all these things that they do and they measure, and they're pretty good at figuring all of that out. But the soul, that's the other part of us that we carry around. We don't just carry around our body, we carry around our soul. And there's no reason to suspect that our souls aren't as complex as our body. It's just that we can't see it. You know, in the old days, before all of our technology, people used to think the body wasn't that complex. They couldn't understand so many things that were happening to people. They just thought it was a sim simple things at work, but now we know different. Soul, things happen to us. And the things that happen to us can have a dramatic effect on us, just like things that can happen to us physically. We can get injuries in our soul. Some things might be minor. Someone hurts your feelings. You get over it in a few days. Some things can be very difficult to get over. You can, gain, you can have something infest you in your soul that just plagues you, like almost like a chronic disease that can happen over time. And last week, I explained that, the, you know, Jesus coming, one of the things that the Bible clearly says is that we can have Jesus not living outside of us, but living in us, and that's our hope of glory. And I made the analogy, and I think it's fairly accurate, that if you have Jesus in you, you have sort of this immune system uh, that's, that can help with all of the things that might 
injure your soul, the things that will happen over life that you'll need to recover from, but you'll need something in you in order to accomplish that. And so that's the promise that Jesus gave when he died on the cross and rose again. Uh, when he went to see his uh, disciples in the upper room, he made a way for him, the Holy Spirit, to live in people. And in John 20, talked about it last week, he's, he breathed on the people, his followers, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he was breathing out the Holy Spirit that was in him, and they were bringing it in to them. And they were the first people, other than Jesus and Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had the Holy Spirit in them. But when they fell, that communion with God was separated. And every single human being between Adam and Eve and Jesus lived life without God in them. God would speak to them. God would empower them at times. All those things would happen, but God did not live in them. There was not a holy place for God to live in. Jesus had to die and pay for all of their sins to create a holy place back in them. And in that spot, at that time after he was resurrected, they were the very first human beings to have the Holy Spirit live in them. In a way, really a new species of human being with the ability to walk in the world, deal with all of the contaminants and toxins and injuries that come against any human being, against their soul, and be able to overcome them or deal with them or be healed by them. So that's the premise that we're working on. Uh, you know, the, the gifts that God gives, I mean, there's a lot of things He gives, but the greatest gift that you can possibly have in this life is Christ in you. Because as you go through life, things are going to happen along the way. So um, using that and, and uh, trying to connect the things in Scripture, I want to read for you in, in Luke chapter 4. Just read these, these words. When Jesus first began his ministry, the very first thing that he said at the beginning of his ministry, his first sermon, if you will, it begins in verse 16. It says, as he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he grew up in Nazareth. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this is what's written in Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendants and, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was establishing at the very beginning of his ministry, this is why I came, to do these things, to establish certain freedoms, if you will. And he's talking primarily about issues of the soul. As I said last week, uh, we are made in the image of God, Trinitarian. We have body, soul, and spirit. 
they're connected. So sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between what's going on in your body and spirit and body and soul and all of that. It, it's a very, it's a connected thing. So, you know, your attitude can affect your brain chemistry, body. Your brain chemistry could affect your spirit. You know, there's, it, it, it's, there's just issues and all of that. It's very connected, just like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a oneness and yet a separation as well. We talked about how in the Old Testament, God instructed a tabernacle to be built, which was a holy of holies, a holy place, and an outer courtyard. And that's analogous too to us, because we are the tabernacle of God now. Holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, we looked last week, that's a picture of Jesus living in that holy of holies the deepest part of us. And then the holy place, that's analogous to our soul. And things are, are placed in our soul, and, and we'll, we'll look at some of that perhaps today, but there's things that are in our soul that uh, were analogous to the things that were placed in the holy place in the tabernacle. Then there's this outer courtyard that's analogous to our body. That's the part people can see and understand and relate to. But this stuff in here, no one can see it unless we reveal it to them. So we have a holy place and we have a holy holies. And fundamentally, in order for our souls to be helped and healed, the first thing we got to do is park the ark or Jesus into the Holy of Holies. That's a huge thing. That's a huge thing. Because God works from the outside or from the inside out. He works from that place into our soul and brings about the healings and help that we need to navigate the world and to recover whatever health that we need in this life. It's an inside-out process. Human beings forever try to deal with the issues of their soul from the outside in. Like changing their circumstances or, or trying to, you know, read self-help things or things that just like, come on, help me out. And they try to bring about recovery outside in. Perhaps it helps to some degree, but it's not the same as the great physician, physician in you working out. So Jesus came to deal with our soul. The other thing to recognize humbly is that we are very stupid about protecting our souls. We've become fairly aware of how to watch out for our bodies. You know, we, we've, you know, we might quarantine because we have uh, a virus. We might uh, avoid toxic places. You know, if there's a toxic chemical spill, we'll say, hey, don't go over there. Don't breathe that stuff in. Don't take it in. Uh, we're, we're worried about contaminants in our environment physically. Uh, and we're careful about all of that. We're trying to clean up our environment physically so that we won't be sick, so that we might live. At the same time that we're doing that, we have become incredibly careless about all the toxins that can come into our soul through our ears and through our eyes, through our experiences. And, um, and those things have a dramatic effect. It's not a coincidence. Or are these, did I just say it's not a coincidence? I guess it's not. It's not just random that at the same time that we are in many ways living in the cleanest environment, 
most prosperous places, safe and warm, huge opportunities all around us at the same time. The readouts in people's soul psychologically is the highest levels of suicide and depression and anxiety and separation and, 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 and conflict and confusion. Those things are at a very high level because we haven't been careful with what comes in to us. And with the um, spread of social media and media of all kinds, uh, we are exposed to a lot more. And so, while we may be fairly good at quarantining with a physical virus, it's like if there's a social virus contaminating people, we get exposed all the time. It just shows up. And it often makes people very, very sick. Let me give you some examples of that from these words in Luke. Jesus says that I came to preach good news to the poor. What's it mean to be poor in your soul? It means you don't have enough. It means that in the, as you're navigating life and you think about what you can do and you can't do, if you think about what opportunities might be available, you self-select because in your soul, if you're poor, you go, I don't have enough for that. You know, someone might say, uh, you see this a lot in young people, when we say to them, as their parents or grandparents, we'll say, hey, Jan, you can do this, or you, this could happen, you can have this kind of life, and many times in their soul, they'll hear those words, and they'll go, you know, I don't have enough. You'll run across people who um, man, they keep settling you know, they're on maybe their third or fourth uh, marriage or relationship. And uh, they pick out this person to get with, and everybody goes, what are you doing? Why them? It's because they think, well, all of my value, all of my purpose, all of that was already used up. It's the best I can do. Sometimes their poverty comes because their how they would feel about it is, you know, I, I, I once, you know, my life was like this, and I, but I made this choice and that choice. I gambled on this and I gambled on that and I lost it all. Now I don't have enough. Or for someone else, it might be, I got robbed. I didn't have the opportunity. I was taken from me. And they don't know that in Christ, all the riches of the kingdom of God are available to them. They're not poor. They're rich. Jesus says, I came to tell the poor some good news. You're not poor. You're rich. Oh, this is inconvenient. It's my cell phone. My daughter calling me during church. Oh boy, that's not good. 
And now it's going to be on the internet. Oh, gee, that's terrible. I should. You're right. Hello. Yeah. 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 I came to heal the brokenhearted. This life will, in all likelihood, break your heart. Jesus has come to heal the brokenhearted. You know, you can tell what a brokenhearted person, uh, how that works in them. It's like they cannot keep love in their heart for people. Like it leaks out. <laughs> it's like, man, I want to, but you just, other emotions overtake love. It just sort of keeps leaking out. You know, on Monday they're like, oh man, I'm so happy and love all my family and this and that. And by Wednesday it's like, oh gosh. It just keeps leaking out. Some people, it's, it's not just leaking out. It's, they become really hard-hearted. It's like they can't afford, they think, to make their heart tender anymore. I'm going to harden that thing up. I'm not going to give my heart anymore. And so they hold a place of, of separation from people that love them, who they would love to love, but they can't or won't. There's no overcoming a broken heart except through Jesus, really. He came to heal the broken heart. Set the captives free. At the same time that we have uh, Christ living in us, we still continue with not just the inheritance of Jesus, but the inheritance of Adam, which is that we have a sin nature. Man, it'd be nice if it wasn't this way, but we like a lot of our sin. We're tempted. The thing about tempt temptations you got to really deal with is that they're really tempting. I mean, they're really tempting. That's what makes them temptations. And it's possible, it's common, it's probably universal to some degree that within that sin nature where there's some contaminants that have come our way and we have learned to live with and try to monitor and control besetting sins. The stuff that we've vowed we would never do again, we've prayed that it won't ever be part of us, the stuff that sometimes has diminished our life completely and yet we keep going back to it when we're stressed or filled with anxiety or whatever it is and it just it we're like a prisoner to it you know certainly things that we call addictions are there but there's many things that are that just have a hold on you and you know it hurts you paul says in romans 7 you know i don't understand myself the things i want to do i i don't do things I don't want to do, I end up doing. It's like, <laughs> I got to deal with this because it's fouling up my life. Well, Jesus came that you could be set free from those things. Actually be in control under His authority of every part of your life. Give sight to the blind. If you're a, a student of Scripture, I'll say this about me. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much a student of Scripture. I, I know a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot in the Scripture, a lot of truth, a lot of things to know, a lot of prophecy, a lot of promises, all those things. And, man, if you see it, if you see it, it can be a lamp unto your feet. 
can be like guidance for you into the future. But blind people can't see. Blind people, spiritually blind, blind people, keep walking into the same devastating, tripping up places, stumbling around, deciding this, doing that, falling, standing. It's like they cannot see how to walk. Man, if Christ is in you, you can see. Now, it's through a glass darkly, and maybe not every nuance and thing, because we live in a pretty dark world, and uh, sometimes it, it's just all you can see is a bit of a shadow or something, but you can know how to walk in the world if Christ lives in you. You can know it. You don't have to keep running into the same stuff and falling over the same things and being fearful about what's out there that might come or might trip you up at some point. And set at liberty those who are oppressed. It's possible, it's probably likely, at some place or point in, in your life is you, that, that you can be sort of um, what's the word? Oppressed. I guess that's the word. That's what he says. But it's just, it's like you're you're just like uh, you keep your head down like this. You stop really and looking around, and and you start you, you you're like you can you can start to only inhabit a small corner of your life when God has all of this life for you to have an abundant life. It's like you're, you're like so discouraged about what that might be. So not thinking that that's for you, that you just live in this little spot when there's all this to live. These are all issues of the soul. Do you see what I'm saying? These are things that live in you. You know, kind of, at least the generally, kind of where that is for you. And then Jesus says this last thing. He says, And I've came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So what that means is this. In Jewish law, it was established that once every 50 years that um, they were going to have a do-over for the whole country. So at a 50-year mark, all the debts were to be forgiven. Anybody that got themselves in some sort of slavery, they were to be set free. Uh, land that had been forfeited would go back to the owner of the land. And it was like every 50 years, Man, you know, it took us 50 years to get us in this weird, troublesome spot. Uh, but we're going to just do a do-over. It might be a good idea in a country <laughs> sometimes. It's like, let's just start over. <laughs> but in the whole history of the Jewish nation, they never actually did that. They never started over. Because it's complicated and, and um, never seemed like the right time. So there was never a year where they could begin again. 
So Jesus says, I came to say that this is that year. So one of the mentalities that keep us sort of in a, in a place that, that God would want to free us from is this mentality that Okay, that's great, but not yet. I can't, ex- I can't experience it yet. It's too much stuff. It's, I've gone too far. I'm, I'm too much in debt, or, or there's just something there. And I can't actually... It's like someday, someday I'll be free. Someday it'll be different. And Jesus says, that day is today. Like there's never a day that that can't be the day. Never a day that it can't be the day that you get your do-over. That you get your place to begin to live in the fullness of what Christ has for you. No need for delay, ever. Maybe it's that way, you know, just like even in the holidays, I wonder about this sometimes. You can go through a holiday, some people will this year to some degree, with, man, all the things I've lost, all the people I don't have, all of that. but it's the year or the acceptable year of the Lord. You don't have to focus on those things and live and be captive by it. It's what I have and what I gain in Christ. Maybe it's besetting sin kind of things and you know, you're coming up to the New Year's resolution time. You know, a month from now, you're supposed to do the New Year's resolution and it's going to be okay. 2024. <laughs> I'm going to hit it hard this year. I'm going to overcome. It's going to be this and it's going to be that. And I mean, if your willpower is like mine, I don't think I've ever made it maybe to the 3rd of January off of a, uh, at least off of, I mean, there's stuff that I can decide on January 1st and keep that promise because it's stuff that's not besetting sins. It's not stuff that just hangs on me, you know? It's like, yeah, I resolve to not eat broccoli again this year or whatever. I can do those kind of things, although I fail in that because my wife makes me eat broccoli occasionally. But uh, there's stuff that, you know, it's like, man, that's just been such a part of my life. And so, in order to deal with that, what you decide is, I'm not even making the resolution. Why even try? Because I know I'll fail. Well, it's a different year if Christ is in you. Yeah, you're weak, and yeah, you can't do it, but Christ in you can be made strong in your weakness. Wherever that that place of struggle and failure is, I mean, even if you fall, you can give it up instead of just stay there. Because Christ can give you strength to live.
Well, I think, I feel like I should just tell you this, this one little story instead of looking at these things in uh, the tabernacle, <laughs> the furniture. You'll have to wait till next week to see what's parked in your soul. Um, it's pretty nice stuff that God has done there. But uh, before we get to that, there's this other story. So they had their tabernacle. God instructed how it was to be built. It was put in place uh, in this tent, the Holy of Holies. And then they would move around the, the country and then ultimately into the promised land out of the wilderness. And, and so they would pack up the tent and they would move from place to place. And as they moved from place to place, they would take the Ark of the Covenant with them. And it usually went in front. And the priests would carry it and go to the next place. And as they entered into the promised land, as that was their tradition to go from place to place with that, they noticed along the way that, man, we do really good when we're walking around if Christ is leading us, if He's in front, if the ark is in front. And so they would go into battles and they'd win the battles. They would be in situations like the Jericho and the walls would fall down. And, and so it is, this is great carrying the ark around everywhere we went. And so they had great success. And then they got in their head this idea that, well, we don't really need to think about what God wants us to do. We'll just carry the ark around. It's like, it's like a magic thing for us. We'll just carry it in the battle. We'll decide who we're going to fight. We're, we'll decide what we're going to do, and we'll take our superhuman ark with us in anything that we do. And so the very next time with that attitude that they did that, man, they lost the battle, and the ark got captured. I mean, that's bad when you lose uh, the presence of God to a foreign enemy. Lost it to the Philistines. And the Philistines were really happy to have this thing, the ark, with them. I mean, this thing that they had seen be carried around and, and great power emanated from it in some way. And so they captured it, and being good Philistines and good uh, sort of polytheists, like many people are, it's like, we captured the Jewish God. What should we do with the Jewish God? Well, we'll put the Jewish God in with our God. They had a God that they worshipped, Dagon. Had a temple to Dagon. Carving a Dagon. I don't really know why this was their idea for an idol of their God, but it was half human and half fish. And, um, and their religion was all around the worship of Dagon. And so they put the ark in with their temple, the temple with Dagon, and uh, thought, man, two gods are better than one. We're going to be great now. We should be able to do it all. We got theirs, and now we got ours, two of them. So um, they do that. They park that ark in there, and then the next day the priests come in, and uh, their idol, Dagon, has fallen down. It's really frustrating when you have a particular God that falls down on you. And they did what good human beings do when their God falls. Well, we got to figure a way to prop them back up. <laughs> Didn't occur to them that they have an issue. Just, man, our God's not working for us right now. It's not looking good. So they prop them back up. Get it all worked out. The next day, the priests come in there and uh, their God has fallen down again. Only this time, its hands and its head have broken off. And they're starting to occur to them that they have a problem. And they do come to probably a proper conclusion, which is these two gods are not going to get along in the same temple. And so they make a decision 
very interesting decision. They say, well, we got to separate these gods. We will get the ark out of here and then we'll glue our God back together. And we'll continue worshiping our God. And that's what they did. And they parked the, the ark off uh, in a guy's house. Turned out to be a blessing to that guy in a different way. And, and ultimately the story happens with David that the ark has returned. But here's the point for today. You are the temple of God. You have a holy of holies in you. And you have a God. Something lives in the holy of holies. The dominating decider of how you live your life. Something lives there. We all live under some cider, some mindset, some way that, you know, when we, you ever do this when you're a kid, like you flip, like I'm going to do this or that and flip the coin and heads I'm going to do this and tails I'm going to do that. And then it lands on the one you, you really don't want to do. And so you flip it again. It's like, because that's the one you're really, you know, I'm going to pretend I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do, but I'm really going to do this one thing. There's a decider. But uh, here's the thing. If Jesus lives in that place, and you're holy of holies, he doesn't share it. Nothing else gets to live there but him. Whatever else might have been there, whatever else could have dominated in your life, whatever other thing was helping to compel you to choose in certain directions, once Jesus lives in you, it falls. And I guess you can make a decision, well, I don't want that. I need to move Jesus out like they did. But that's not our decision, is it? We know so different. Our decision is, Lord, <laughs> I want to live under your authority, your purposes. If Christ lives in you, you can walk upon the earth. You're going to get battered and you'll have battles, and there will be places where it'll seem like at least defeat for a season. But you rise and you stand and the things in your soul that depress fill you with dread at times, those things diminish over time. The peace of God referees and oversees your life. The joy of the Lord, which is a buoyancy. The joy of the Lord isn't like, woohoo, I'm happy every second of every day. Because stuff can really bring you down. Something can really take you down. But the joy of the Lord is like this buoyancy that's like, Oh, but you can't stay there. Just, you come back up. And these days, people need Jesus. Because there's something else going on for many. So two things. One is, uh, you know, if for, for some reason you're like, well, you know, I don't really know if Jesus is in me. Well, let's 
let's make, ask him in. Just ask him in. Today, today is the day of your salvation. Just ask him in. Let him be there. Let, see what happens when Jesus is in the Holy of Holies. And the other thing is that if Jesus is in you, you're contagious in a different way. Just like other people can give you their stuff. You know, that happens sometimes, right? You hang around with a group of people and it's like, man, I caught whatever they had. (laughs) In your soul a little bit. But man, if people start hanging around with you, and Jesus is in you, they catch what you have. The light, the love, the joy, the peace. Most of the time they catch it when they are vulnerable themselves in their soul, hurting, weak, sad. And they see you have having experienced similar circumstances, but instead of anger and bitterness and hatred and depression, they see in you hope and joy and peace. And they go, man, I could use some of that. Light is coming into the world. And all these people that got sick this week from that little virus, They'll get over it. All the people around us during the holiday season, man, let's have them not catch COVID. Let's not have them not catch despair. But a little bit of light and a little bit of hope. Amen. And what a great gift we have to be able to walk around on this planet with Jesus in us, the hope of glory. Let's stand together. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being the great physician. Lord, uh, you see the diseases and the, the injuries that we've encountered in our, in our soul, Lord. You know exactly what's needed in every situation. Lord, perhaps uh, for us today, we would say, yeah, you know, I am a little bit brokenhearted or I have been dealing with kind of a blindness. Lord, I pray that whatever it is, God, that that is uh, an infirmity in us, a place of, of struggle, a place of uh, taking us down a little bit, God, that, that you would help us in this season to overcome, to experience all of the fullness that you desire for us in our soul, the health that uh, we so much need. Jesus, uh, I pray for our world, because light has come into the world And people do prefer darkness over light. But darkness cannot overcome the light. And greater are you that is in us than it is in the world. There is nothing, no power, no strength, no future experience, no past experience that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, as uh, we move through this holiday season, may we be of good cheer knowing that you have overcome the world. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.